So tonight's program is called The Ins and the Outs of Insurance and Specialty Pharmacy. You can read it. I can say it. We can go through this again and again. So there I am, a very young version. I got dark hair compared to what I've got now. And yes, we are thankful for our supporters. We have Sandoz and Bristol Myers Squibb who are supporting this series that we're doing with Dr. Gary Owens. And as I say, Dr. Gary Owens, um, Dr. Gary Owens, he's a... Um, He's going to introduce himself, but he's very, very in tune with specialty pharmacy. And as as we just said, as the label goes, the ins and the outs, he's going to speak with you tonight about specialty pharmacy and you. What if I disagree with health insurance and your company and the company's decisions on things? For instance, what if your insurance company says, no, I'm not insuring you. I'm not insuring you. Well, let's listen to what Dr. Owens has to say about this. All right. And um, and the appeals process, you know, when when, you know, you get past that point and you have to get even further along. And let's listen again to what Dr. Owens has to say. You ready, Dr. Owens? I'm ready. Anytime you are, Stuart. Great. Take it away. It's all yours. Well, thank you, Stuart. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everybody is. As uh, Stuart said, I'm Gary Owens, and I'll introduce myself. And uh, But before I do, uh, I will point out that this is really part two of a two-part series. I uh, hopefully spoke to some of you back in, in June, uh, where we talked a bit about specialty pharmacy, and we also talked a good bit about insurance coverage. Uh, and I was prompted uh, by Stuart uh, to do that, among other things, because I recently saw a survey uh, that showed just even the most simple health insurance terms, things of us who have been in that business in the past take for granted, are poorly understood by the vast majority uh, of Americans. In fact, I saw a recent survey in Forbes magazine that uh, showed that uh, less than 50% of people understood terms like deductibles, co-payments, and even less than 75% understood things like co-insurance and a few other terms. Uh, so that's what prompted me to to do this, as well as a question I received in in, in the last presentation. And that question, I won't uh, give, give you the whole question, but it was framed, how can my insurance company make me fill in the blank? Uh, and, uh, you know, I pointed out the insurance company can never make you do anything uh, because you have the right of appeal. So what I'm going to do tonight really is focus a bit on specialty pharmacy just to re-explain that. There'll be a little bit of repetition from the previous talk, uh, and that's for those who may not have heard that. And then I'm going to talk to you about what do I do if I disagree with my insurance company? Uh, what are my appeal rights? What types of appeals are there? And, you know, what's my best way to handle that? But uh, by way of self-introduction, uh, uh, I will point out that I was a primary care physician to start my career uh, and then transition to work for over two decades uh, in the insurance industry, most of it in the Blue Cross system uh, in the Philadelphia area, which is still uh, where I reside, although I'm speaking to you today from beautiful Ocean View, Delaware, which is also uh, very hot and uh, humid today because we're tucked in between uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the Inland Bay, so on, on this barrier strip of land that uh, can get quite uh, a muggy at times. So I, I feel your pain sometimes, uh, Stuart, between the transition of the cool inside and uh, the warm outside. Uh, since I left uh, uh, the insurance world after retiring from there, uh, I became a consultant and I consult to various healthcare companies uh, around issues of insurance coverage, specialty pharmacy, pharmacy management, uh, and PBMs. Uh, why do you say, okay, why, why would a guy like this ever focus on MS? And there are several reasons for, for that reason. Number one, uh, of, of course, is that uh, uh, MS is a common illness that we see and cover in the insurance business, but that's not the main one. Uh, the main one is I actually have two family members uh, with multiple sclerosis, one who's had the disease uh, for several decades now uh, and is facing some increasing disability uh, problems, and that relative would be my niece. And then I have a, a son who was diagnosed with MS about six, almost seven years ago now, and who is doing uh, uh, quite well, all things uh, considered, although he always tells me on days like this, uh, as we know with MS, he's particularly sensitive to the hot weather. 
And because of that professional in the insurance industry, in the personal uh, industry, uh, I've been privileged to work with a lot of MS organizations, MS specialists, uh, a co-payment assistance foundation, uh, and the payer community, and have uh, lectured and published on uh, issues of MS. So it's really my privilege to speak with you today and hopefully uh, can help you better understand a few things. So again, the repetitious part of my talk uh, is about specialty pharmacy. And I determine it friend or foe, and I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to give you some of the pros and cons of specialty pharmacy. But what I really want to focus on, remember that question that I got asked, what if my insurance company makes me? Uh, and I'm going to talk about what if my doctor and I disagree with a coverage decision on my health plan? What are my rights? You know, how do I go about appealing? What are the different kinds of appeals? In fact, does everything have to get to an appeal? Uh, and to really uh, talk about that, not only in commercial insurance, but in Medicare insurance, because while the two are similar, there are also some key differences that you do need to understand. So let's talk about specialty uh, pharmacy. So as we move on into that part of this, the uh, presentation, you know, we'll just ask the question, what is specialty pharmacy? Well, in order to understand specialty pharmacy, we need to really understand the term, and that term is specialty drugs. Uh, and from a medical definition, specialty drugs are those high cross prescription medications. Generally, they're used to treat complex conditions, chronic diseases, uh, things that come to mind, of course, MS, of, because that's the topic and the focus of today. But oncology, cancer is another area. Inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, respiratory diseases, pulmonary hypertension, asthma, uh, and even some allergic diseases like uh, eczema, food allergies, and the like are treated with specialty pharmaceuticals. So because these are a very different class of drugs than the typical drugs that you go down to the corner drugstore, hand the uh, uh a pharmacist, a prescription, and now I'm dating myself because now almost all prescriptions go electronically and we don't ever touch that piece of paper uh, anymore, but uh, I use that metaphorically. Uh, specialty pharmaceuticals uh, are, are basically handled by specialty pharmacies who are drug distributors that really focus on these high-cost, high-touch medications that I described uh, in the previous uh, uh, section. And so why are there specialty pharmacies? Why can't my pharmacist handle uh, these? And, and, and part of it's because these drugs can sometimes be complex. They can have complex uh, administration routines. They can be IV. Some of them may require pre-medication. Some of them may require extended infusion times or monitoring. Or in many cases, some of them can be just simply pills, but they have some very unique actions and side effects. And MS treatments are generally considered uh, specialty drugs. Uh, and, and in general, you can't take most of your MS prescriptions uh, to your local pharmacist and, uh, you know, wait and have that prescription filled. And there are many reasons for that. One is because of these high cost medicines, they may be not be in stock uh, uh, in your local pharmacy because they may not have a huge demand and there may be a big inventory cost of carrying these drugs. And, and the other reason, of, of course, is that because these drugs are complex and there's a lot of information needed and complex interactions that people need to understand, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that needs to be done before you get that prescription. And that's where these specialty pharmacies come into play. And, and so why do insurance companies use specialty pharmacies? And part of it's because almost half the cost of drugs and we're spending almost $400 uh, billion on pharmaceuticals in the United States. And almost half of that cost is now specialty pharmacy. Uh, but that only takes into account uh, about 5% of patients. So these drugs only uh, take care of the needs of a very small number of patients because most people don't have disease states uh, that require specialty pharmaceuticals, uh, yet it accounts for half the cost. So it's one of those focuses where a very small number of insurance companies' members uh, have a very high uh, expense. And of course, as you know, MS drugs are expensive uh, and uh, managing that expense is something that specialty pharmacies attempt to do because they can work with patients to look for uh, uh, 
manufacturer assistance or foundation assistance in helping you get your medication, or sometimes even work with you and your doctors to form, to find, I should say, not form, find equally efficacious and maybe less expensive uh, therapeutic alternatives. And then finally, because some of the MS drugs may have side effects or uh, need some side effect management, especially pharmaceuticals can, uh, pharmacies can work with you there. And if, if you look, you know, the MS drugs aren't alone, as I alluded to earlier in the uh, uh, talk, and I just wanted you to have a little indication of the types of patients that represent that 5% that use specialty drugs. Of course, cancer is one of the biggest ones. Uh, people with liver disease like hepatitis C, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we talked about pulmonary diseases, uh, immune deficiency diseases, other neurologic diseases, things like ALS uh, uh, and in children, um, de degenerative neurologic diseases, and, and some uh, blood uh, uh, deficiency diseases, some types of anemia, especially those brought on by chronic kidney disease are managed by specialty pharmacies and use specialty drugs. Uh, so it, it's uh, uh, you know a wide range of diseases, but still a small number of patients. So what happens at a specialty pharmacy before you get your prescription? Well, the first thing that happens is prior authorization. And as I described in part one of my talk, prior authorization uh, is basically uh, requiring uh, that your physician document the medical necessity uh, of the drug. And uh, that medical necessity is matched up against a set of criteria that are evidence-based. Uh, and it means the payer is going to evaluate those uh, that request against those evidence-based criteria. And in some cases, it may mean that there's a bit of back and forth between the specialty pharmacy uh, and your physician uh, before medical necessity uh, can be established. And in some cases, as we're going to focus on later in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, it may mean that your insurance company says no for the indication so chosen or for the stage of your MS so chosen. Uh, this disease, in our opinion, is not appropriate. And then what do you do if you and your physician disagree? Another important term, and again, I remember in that Forbes article, less than 50% of Americans understand what a formulary is, but formulary in its simplest terms is a list of covered drugs by your insurance company. And what about if that drug is not on formulary? Uh, well, there's a couple of options. Your physician or you uh, can request a change to a formulary drug if there's one that's equally efficacious and perhaps can be just as good or the physician may need to justify either beforehand or after a denial has been issued that the formulary uh, drug is not appropriate for your condition and a non-formulary drug is appropriate. And really there are even two kinds of prior authorization. Uh, there's what we like to call the soft prior authorization. I'll be honest with you, this doesn't occur much uh, uh, in MS, which is basically uh, your doctor prescribes a drug, uh, they confirm the diagnosis of MS, and after that, the product is approved. And while that happens in some specialty conditions, for instance, rare genetic disorders where there may be only uh, 100 of these patients in the country or 500 of these patients in the country, there are only a handful of specialists usually at academic centers that take care of these patients. And uh, if they say, uh, you know, uh, my my patient has a long chain fatty acid oxidation disorder. Now there's a mouthful and you're not supposed to remember that, but that's a disease that only a few hundred people in the country have. That's good enough for most payers to say, okay, if you verified that condition, we'll approve the drug. Uh, typically in MS, there's more of a hard PA. Your doctor prescribes a drug uh, that, uh, as I've already alluded to, uh, the uh, uh, doctor then justifies the medical necessity against a set of criteria. Uh, and if that matches the criteria, uh, the product is approved. And as I pointed out, almost all MS drugs are going to require a hard PA, mostly because there are now more than 23 drugs, not counting the biosimilars uh, for the treatment of MS. And some drugs are better used in different circumstances. So what does that all mean from a timing standpoint? Well, it means that there, this may take some time before you get your prescription uh, the, the first time. 
Uh, here's some rules of thumb I think you can follow. Payers are required to turn around complete prior authorization requests within 72 hours. So they have to turn that request around and either say yes or no uh, within 72 hours. If it's an urgent request, meaning that you have a life-threatening or perhaps a condition where you're likely to deteriorate very quickly and have difficulty recovering, Generally not the case with most MS drugs because, you, as you know, uh, the pace of MS tends to be more uh, slowly progressive, but urgent requests have to be turned around within 24 hours. Uh, but therein lies one problem because if the request is not complete by your physician, the health plan may have to go back to your physician and there may be a bit of back and forth. And most laws allow uh, for that process where there are incomplete requests uh, that process can take up to 30 days, meaning uh, the plan has to get back to the physician within 72 hours, but they give the physician 72 hours to respond to them, which in turn opens another 72 hours. And you can see how that can play out to several uh, days. And then once the uh, prescription is approved, then the specialty pharmacy has 24, 48 hours uh, to really ship it. So in the best of circumstances, uh, you know, three to five days is the probably the quickest one can expect from time of request approval uh, to shipping. And there's one other rub that has to happen in shipping by the specialty pharmacy. It uh, doesn't happen until member payment responsibility uh, is met. So if there is a delay in getting member payment or there is a delay in getting payment assistance plus the member's uh, contribution, uh, that can even make that a bit longer. And so that was a real quick summary of uh, uh, specialty pharmacy and the process and what I'm really leading up to and what the next portion of the talk is going to focus on is, is, is what, what do I do if me or my doctor disagree uh, with the decision? And this is really just a high level concept. The first thing you want to find out is why you're being denied. And health plans have to give you that reason, both verbally and in writing. Uh, you then want to work with your doctor or perhaps appoint a representative uh, to gather evidence uh, to dispute uh, uh, that uh, negative decision. Uh, that may mean talking to your doctor or in more cases, not necessarily your doctor, but a representative. A lot of uh, physicians and health systems now have patient advocates who will help them. And there are even some patient advocacy groups out there uh, who can help you. You know, once you've launched the appeal, and I'm going to talk a, a good bit more about how to do that, uh, you then need to give those reasons why you disagree to your uh, uh, in, in sure. Uh, and, and, and basically, if they still say no, that's not the end of the story. In all 50 states and under Medicare, you have more levels of appeal than just that first, I disagree uh, with you, Mr. or Ms. Insurance Company. So let's get into uh, a bit about appeals and, uh, you know, what do I do? Uh, so let's understand your rights and also the different types of appeals, because this next slide is really going to talk about what I think is is kind of the most important thing to understand. And that is, what, what are your rights in appeals? Um, first of all, it's a legal right. It's a contractual right, and it's also a state and federal law right there. Uh, regulations, uh, that are put out by the uh, Department of Labor in the state. It's often the Department of Health or the Department of Insurance. Uh, and in all 50 states and federally, you have a legal right of appeal. So it's not just uh, the health plan uh, providing that they are required by law to do it. Um, all plans, whether they're individual plans, whether they're group insurance plans, whether it's through an employer or even Medicaid or Medicare, uh, have, have to provide you with a process and have to explain that process to you about how to appeal an adverse uh, determination. So if you contact your insurance company, and I'll talk a, a bit more about that, they not only have to tell you, yes, you have the right of appeal, but they have to tell you how to go about doing that appeal. Now, they don't have to tell you what evidence to provide or how to write a letter or how to uh, do things verbally, but they have to give you the process the timelines and a statement of your rights. Uh, that being said though, while all health plans do have an appeals process, uh, whether it's commercial, whether it's employer 
uh, funded, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid. Many of those timelines and deadlines associated with the appeals differ, and it's very important uh, that you understand that, hence making sure uh, that your health plan has provided you with an overview of the process of how to appeal an adverse determination. And that's why I think this is one of the most important slides uh, for you to focus on. There's another one that's almost at the end of the talk, uh, uh, and, and not that the rest in between is filler, because it gives you some very important information. But these are the things to remember. You do have a legal right of appeal. Uh, that's protected both federally and at the state level. And so as we move along, I'm going to talk about really four types of appeals tonight. Over on the right-hand side, I also wanted to point out this is just an example. Uh, most state departments of health or insurance uh, in New Jersey, it's Dobie, the Department of Banking uh, and, and Insurance uh, 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 have guidelines and booklets uh, that they have on their websites that can also help you understand appeals. So that's another place to go for resources. I'm going to talk about four kinds of appeals. The first one is an exception request, which is really a preemptive strike, if I may put it that way, because you actually do that before you get a denial, uh, because you or your doctor already know the medicine they want to prescribe is not on the formulary uh, and therefore, you want to get an exception before the denial even happens. The next level is really what we call the informal appeal, where your doctor uh, requests what's called a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with a medical director at the health plan. So that's a doctor-to-doctor -doctor conversation. And very often, that can resolve the issue with ever, out, ever having to get to a formal level of appeal. But remember, that is informal and peer-to-peer -peer conversations between your doctor and the doctor at the health plan do not have the same legal rights that you do uh, as a member under the consumer-friendly laws at the federal and state level. And I'm going to talk in particular about uh, <clears throat> the appeals process in general terms for commercial insurance plans and for Medicare. And you may say, well, gee, you left out Medicaid. And my, my answer there is because Medicaid is a state-funded uh, program the, the uh, process of appeals, while there are some common threads, differs from state to state. Uh, and when you see one Medicaid appeals process, you've seen one Medicaid appeals process. And uh, a little more, uh, your eyes would glaze over if we gave overviews of 50 state processes. So let's look at that exception request, first of all. It is written, so it's formal. Uh, it's a request to your health plan, and that can be a commercial or a Medicaid plan, to seek approval for a drug that's already outside of the payer's coverage policy. So that means that your doctor already knows it's not on the formulary or perhaps knows that your particular uh, set of circumstances don't meet the medical necessity or the policy criteria for that uh, health plan. Uh, once uh, uh, you decide to uh, appeal, uh, uh, are not appeal, but ask for an exception because, again, it is not an appeal. It's a pre, uh, preemptive uh, request. You can submit that request. More often, the physician submits that request. Or sometimes you may have a, a family member or even a legal representative can submit uh, your request. But in the end, you're going to be required to sign forms to authorize uh, your doctor or any representative to submit on your behalf. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, the exception request does require supporting documentation. Remember, that can come from your doctor, yourself, or your representative uh, that we talked about in the previous slide, uh, but it does require supporting documentation. Why do I think my patient, if I'm a doctor, or I need this exception? Perhaps it's, well, I've tried the medications on your formulary and I had a adverse reaction to one or more of them, or I failed uh, on them, or my doctor uh, thinks because of maybe I have another condition that those medications would not uh, be in my best benefit. Um, and, and so all of those are the type of documentation. And commercial plans have policies that may that allow them uh, to manage these exception requests. And typically they'll turn uh, them around again within 72 hours. There is one thing if a drug is particularly excluded, and when I say excluded, I'm not talking about not being on the formulary. I'm talking about if the drug has an exclusion uh, from benefits. So say your plan doesn't cover lifestyle drugs, what they've determined to be lifestyle drugs. And some classic examples 
uh, have been things like uh, 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 treatment uh, uh, for weight loss or uh, treatment for smoking cessation, even though I could argue that those are no longer lifestyle drugs. They're still in that excluded list. And you can't use that if the drug is specifically uh, excluded from coverage. So what's the next thing? And this is what we call the peer-to-peer -peer discussion. Um, you know, the doctor is often the first one to know uh, about the denial, especially uh, if uh, uh, they've done the process online because uh, uh, th that uh, may give them the information uh, very quickly, uh, while at the same time you're being notified in, in a process that may involve both a phone call and a letter. And of course, as you know, letters may take a few days to arrive. And if your doctor uh, gets that denial, uh, even, uh, you know, in the absence of you knowing it, they actually may request to speak to a planned decision maker, typically a medical director. That's why it's called a peer to peer. And in all 50 states, uh, uh, a final denial cannot be issued by any other person uh, than a peer. Uh, it's a bit of a myth that uh, it, it, I've heard uh, propagated, and it is absolutely a myth that, you know, a clerk at the insurance company with no training denied my request. Uh, yes, that clerk can pen your request for review, which ultimately leads to a denial. But in all 50 states and in Medicare, that final denial must be reviewed and signed off on by a licensed physician. And, and so that peer-to-peer -peer request is an opportunity for your doctor to state the reasons why the drug they want uh, is necessary and why they disagree with the decision. And again, filling in the blanks of, you know, perhaps uh, you have already tried or failed a previous medication, or you have uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a medical condition, an eye condition or a blood pressure condition that might not allow you to take certain MS medications. And the good news is if this results in a positive decision by the plan, uh, the story's over. Uh, the denial gets reversed. Nothing else needs to be done by you, the member. So, uh, you know, this informal peer-to-peer -peer process uh, can be very, very useful. It's not always successful, uh, but certainly if your doctor is willing to make that peer-to-peer -peer call, uh, it can resolve the problem quickly, expeditiously, and without a lot of effort on your part. But what are some of the limitations? of that process, uh, you know, the first of all is your, your doctor or their staff must initiate uh, that contact or you can request them to initiate that contact. And as you know, uh, many physician schedules are very busy. Uh, they may not have time to get around to that activity quickly. It may take them a day or two uh, to do it. Uh, or they may say in some cases, you know, just tell the member to uh, uh, appeal. And as I pointed out, this process isn't regulated, it's informal, uh, and it doesn't have those legal protections. Um, and, and that's why I want to point out before we go to the next slide, that you who are the member of the patient benefit from regulations, from legal protections in every state, and your rights of appeal exist at multiple levels. And that's what we're really going to talk about now. What are those levels of appeal? What are some of the differences between commercial insurance and Medicare? And what do you need to know in the appeals process? So let's talk about commercial in, uh, insurance coverage. And, you know, if you get that big red stamp, I put it in gray, not to be so threatening uh, that uh, uh, your request was uh, denied. Well, if a health plan denies your claim, your insurer needs to notify you typically verbally, but you also need to receive a written uh, uh, notice of that denial within 15 days. Uh, uh, and after that, uh, I, it'll give you your, in that it must state your appeal rights and the timelines. There are some other uh, turnaround times. If uh, a medical service is denied, say you were to need a procedure or something, they actually have 30 days to notify you of that. But if the request is for something urgent, they have to notify you both in writing uh, and uh, verbally within 72 hours. So typically in a non-urgent request, you'll receive a verbal feedback, uh, usually relatively quickly, and a written notification, including uh, usually a page or two attached to that notification of your rights of appeal and how to initiate appeals. And again, that's mandated by law. 
And so, as I said, the first step, and that's what I hope the purpose uh, of this talk is is tonight, uh, is to help you understand the process. On almost all health plans now, uh, the appeals process can be found on their website, as well as forms you can use to initiate that appeal. So you actually know what you need to do and complete, such as you have to give them your member ID number. Uh, typically, you have to provide uh, what service uh, uh, you are requesting uh uh, that was not approved via appeal. Uh, but as I pointed out, if you do wait for the denial letter, uh, that process is outlined there. And then once you have that, know that you can do that appeal. You can delegate your physician to do it on your behalf, or you can appoint a, a, a representative. Um, and uh, there is another place you can get the appeals process. I don't recommend it, but I put it in here, and that is in the insurance company's evidence of coverage or plan benefit documents that you get, which you know uh, can run on to tens, uh, 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 sometimes even up to 100 pages, and uh, it's also in there. But, you know, go to the website or call your health plan and ask them to send you a copy by email or wait for the uh, denial letter. And again, once you get into that formal appeals uh, uh, process, you're going to need uh, to either do it yourself or sign an authorization to allow a representative, either your doctor or another representative. And why do you have to do all those forms? Uh, in that just uh, paperwork? Well, no, because of uh, uh, privacy regulations uh, uh, that are out there, um, uh, HIPAA, uh, which is a term that is about the Health Insurance uh, Privacy and Portability uh, Act, uh, they do need your signature on file if you're going to have a third party work with you, such as your doctor or, or another representative. And so to sum this all up, I just want you to remember uh, two things. This is that second, and there's actually a third slide even more to the end. Uh, almost all insurers have a customer service number and it's easy to find. It's on the back of your insurance card in almost all cases. And calling that CSR, customer service representative, uh, to request an appeal can get the process started and they can get you the information you need very quickly, the forms, the process, uh, especially in nowadays uh, world of electronic communication uh, and emails. And again, I'll say this at the risk of being repetitively repetitive, if I can use uh, that word twice, patient-driven appeals have much more protection under the law than provider requests and peer-to-peer -peer calls, which are less well-regulated. So what are the levels of appeal? Uh, there's always an internal level of appeal, and that's a request uh, first level uh, that is uh, uh, internal. So that's why it's on that orange step at the bottom over on the right-hand side. Uh, uh, and then there's often a second uh, uh, internal appeal at the health plan. Uh, and then in all states and in Medicare, there is an external appeal process. That external appeal process is now out of the hands uh, of the insurance company, which means an independent third-party reviewer belonging to what's called an IR. Oh, an independent review organization, and these are organizations certified by the state that you live in or by the federal government to review these plans. And, and an external appeal goes to one of those independent review organizations, so it's no longer in the hands of the decision makers at the health plan. And again, as I close this talk, I'm going to uh, talk to you about some do's and don'ts of the appeals process. That's my third most important slide. And you always have to keep in mind that your appeal may ultimately go to that external level. And so timelines are important and, and most health plans do notify you. Uh, and there may be some variations of this, but uh, typically the health plan has to notify you within that 15 day number uh, uh, for prior authorization. If you've already received the service, which means now they're just denying payment, that can take up to 60 days to notify you. And as I pointed out, there is an expedited process where they have to notify you within 72 hours. <clears throat> I will point out uh, that uh, if you go to external appeal, that can take sometimes a very long time because the independent review organization uh, has a good bit of time to turn around these reviews. They have up to 45 
days to review a standard request. So if you think about a, uh, a health plan denial that maybe took 15 days to get to you, you took 10 days to get your appeal. It took another two or three weeks to do the internal appeal. And after almost uh, uh, you know two months, you decide to, to take it external and they have a month and a half to get back to you. So uh, there can be some lengthy delays, which can be very distressing uh, when you're in need of something. Um, uh, it, it, but there are some states that require this whole process from the time you start until the IRO uh, uh, gives their decision to take no more than 60 days. And of course, they are also bound to turn around expedited uh, requests in 72 hours. And every state has a slightly different way to access that external review process. And in some states, it may even require a small filing fee on the part of you, the member, uh, to request that external appeal. It's typically quite modest, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I just warn you that they may ask for a small uh, uh, fee. Uh, I can assure you the health plans pay the lion's share of the external review uh, process, but some states put that in the law to prevent frivolous uh, requests from going to external appeal. So now let's talk about Medicare appeals. They, they mirror uh, commercial appeals, and these are very busy slides because as is most things with the government, it's a more complex process because in Medicare, you have five levels of appeal, although uh, it rarely goes to that. Uh, and if you look over on the on the left hand side of this slide, uh, if you're appealing a medical benefit drug, what's known as a Part B uh, drug, uh, the uh, the uh, health insurance carrier has 72 hours uh, to turn around that request. Uh, and if it's expedited in Medicare, it's no longer 72 hours, it's 24 hours. And again, in a Part B drug, which is a medical benefit drug, uh, if you ask for a first level appeal, that has to turn around in seven days or in the case of expedited 72 hours. So you can see Medicare makes those first two levels of appeal happen much faster. I think they recognize that among other things, seniors or disabled people, if you happen to be on Medicare due to disability, are a much more vulnerable population. So their processes are a little more aggressive than the state. So now let's turn to this next slide, which gets really busy, but I'm gonna to try to simplify it. Uh, there's Part B drugs. Remember Part B drugs are those drugs you get under your prescription drug benefit. Uh, and there, uh, the, uh, uh, the process for turning around requests are also 72 hours and a redetermination in seven days. And again, the expedited process for Part D drugs is 24 hours and 72 hours. So the B and D, process B, meaning a medical benefit drug, typically a drug that's injected or infused or given in some manner that requires professional supervision versus Part D drugs, which are typically pills or inhalers or things you take yourself, uh, have that uh, 72 and seven day for standard and 24 hour and 72 hour for expedited in the first levels. Again, so pretty aggressive as well. And then after that, let's just show you very quickly uh, the next three levels of Medicare appeal, uh, ones that you won't use uh, uh, a, a whole lot. Uh, you know, after uh, that initial redetermination, uh, the request goes to what's called a, a Medicare uh, 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 PD, and they have another seven uh, days. Then there's an independent review, which has another seven days. That's yet another level. Uh, then there's a, uh, a hearing in front of an administrative law judge, but that can take up to 60 days to happen and up to uh, uh, 90 days to render uh, a decision. And the value of the service has to be at least $180 uh, to go before uh, 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 an administrative law judge. And ultimately, if you still disagree, the fifth level of appeal is to go to federal court uh, with an issue. Uh, but again, the service has to be worth uh, almost $1,200 to go to federal court. And there is an expedited process of this over on the right. I won't walk you through all that. What I really want to say is basically think about those first two levels of appeal that occur very quickly. And the top one 
here, which is that seven day or 72 hour quick turnaround, because that's where most Medicare appeals are resolved in those first two levels, which were internal plan and the third level, which is an external level of appeal. Uh, it is a bit more complex and a bit more bulky. It is faster uh, under Medicare until you get to those very, very high levels of appeal, which I hope most of you will never have to ever access or even need to access. Uh, things won't get that difficult. And so to, to sum it up, you have the right to request an exception as a preemptive way to get what you need. Uh, if you're denied, you have legal rights of appeal and you as a patient have a lot more protection and rights under the law uh, in the appeals process than your physicians. I know that seems counterintuitive, but ultimately uh, the lawmakers wanted to protect you, uh, the patient, and made sure you understood and had uh, rights and that you in the end are your own best advocate. And so some more important facts, your health plan must assist you if you choose to appeal, meaning they have to provide you with the information, uh, the forms and tell you the timelines. Uh, if this seems overwhelming to you, you can have a representative, which can be your doctor or it can be another third party. And you always have multiple level of appeal and you always have the ability to get an external appeal, either through Medicare, through the MAPD or uh, the IRO, the Independent Review Organization uh, at the state. So to bring this home, let me tell you just a few do's and don'ts. You know, make the information you provide to your health plan factual. Uh, it really, uh, the more facts and the less emotion you put in the appeal, and I know it's easy to get angry. Uh, I've had a few claim denials myself, uh, you know, doctors or patients too. It's easy to get angry. Uh, but make sure that you state the facts, make sure you understand and adhere to the timelines, get help if this is overwhelming. Remember, you always have that external uh, level of appeal. And I say be persistent, polite and factual. And across the way on the right hand side, why is that? Uh, don't assume that this is a waste of time that many appeals get overturned. And the other don'ts, don't miss the deadlines because you know the onus on you uh, to do that. Don't try and do it all uh, yourself if it seems overwhelming. Don't put emotional or derogatory statements in appeal communications. I know we all want to do that uh, uh, because we're angry. If that's the case, walk away from your computer, uh, take a break. Uh, because remember, many of these cases may go to external review. And you really don't want that type of information sitting in front of an independent third party uh, external reviewer. And finally, most importantly, don't hesitate to ask questions to your insurance company along the way. What if, how can I, you know, who do I talk to? Uh, what's the status of my appeal? When is it going to be uh, heard internally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so with, with that, Stuart, I'm going to stop talking at these good people uh, and, and let you and them uh, perhaps ask me a few questions. Hi there, I'm back online. And um, and I just wanted to say thank you very much for doing this conversation. And there are a few things though that people are asking that uh, we do have several questions, but I have some questions that you did not speak about. And that is that one of the people wants to know what is a biosimilar? And are you able to tell us what a biosimilar is and also how the biosimilar and how that will be covered by special by specialty pharmacy? Yeah, the best point that I can make is a biosimilar uh, is, is a, a, um, a drug. And in this case, usually a specialty uh, pharmacy drug uh, that can be made once the uh, patent life, the exclusivity rights of the originator drug uh, has run out. So the best uh, metaphor I can give you, we, we all take generic medications. I, I have medications for my cholesterol and high blood pressure and uh, have been on generic medications for a long, long time. They're not uh, cheap carbon copy versions uh, uh, of the uh, original compounds. They are uh, uh, manufactured under rigorous standards and under FDA uh, guidance. And once the period of exclusivity runs out, you have multiple manufacturers making these generic products and the price goes way down. The same is going to be true for biosimilars. Now, for some MS drugs, which are complex biologic processes, these biosimilars will uh, 
get uh, approved by the FDA under a very rigorous uh, process and even need to conduct some uh, clinical trials using the biosimilar because the manufacturing process is so critical. And there may be a limited number of uh, biosimilars, which means they are made in a similar but not identical fashion uh, to your MS biologic drug. Then there's some MS drugs, which are simple chemical compounds. And in that case, uh, there are true generics of them, not biosimilars. Uh, and in, in, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, glutiramir is a, a good example of that. Glutiramir is a generic drug for Copaxone, and that's not a biosimilar. It's a generic because it's manufactured under uh, 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 a, a chemical manufacturing process, not a biologic manufacturing process. <clears throat> Ultimately, biosimilars can save both you and the system money. Uh, uh, because there will be competition, and typically the price of a biosimilar is 15 to 30 percent, sometimes even more, less expensive than the originator. There are some issues there, though. Biosimilars often don't have uh, manufacturer copayment support, so uh, there's a trade off there to be had. On the other hand, if you're in a federal program like Medicare and you can't access foundation uh, support, a biosimilar may create some savings. Uh, for you because uh, uh, they they will be less expensive and your out-of-pocket costs, typically a co-insurance or percentage of the cost of the drug may be less. Uh, going beyond that probably, Stuart, is worthy of a whole nother uh, session. And I, I don't know that I'm totally an expert on biosimilars, but have waited in those waters a good bit in the last couple of years. You're on mute right now, Stuart. I was on mute because there's a dog barking in the background, so I had gotcha. to go on mute. All right. So anyway, um, going a little bit further, though, with the biosimilar. So, you know, there are a lot of MS medications or other medications that aren't even MS related that the brand is losing its patent. And so, you know, we hear about how the drug becomes a generic. But if there are biosimilar comes along, would it be better to use the biosimilar, which is more in line with how the drug is made than, than the generic version? Well, actually, there won't be both, Stuart. If, if the drug for your MS, let's say it's a monoclonal antibody, I'll just use one of those uh, 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 as an example, uh, natalizumab, tysabri, for instance, monoclonal sure. antibody, manufactured using a biologic reactor type process, then that will get a biosimilar. Uh, let's fast forward to uh, if it's a drug that's not manufactured using that biologic type of process. So it's not a complex, uh, large molecule that's made in living uh, reactors by living cells, typically of all sorts of types, then it will be a generic. So there, you won't have to deal with that problem because there won't, won't ever be both a biosimilar and a generic gotcha. version of the, gotcha. of the thing. Gotcha. Though. All right. That's understandable. Thank you very much for that. All right. But how will the biosimilar then be covered by specialty pharmacy? Well, because it's going to be priced similarly, it will okay. be covered by the specialty pharmacy in the same way. It'll, it will likely be prior authorized as well. Uh, I suspect that many insurance carriers and specialty pharmacies, when there are multiple biosimilars of the same drug out there, may ultimately have a preferred biosimilar because they've literally signed a contract to get a best price on a preferred biosimilar. Uh, what I've seen so far is typically, especially pharmacies, if you're on the originator compound and a biosimilar comes along, they may offer you and your doctor a switch, but will grandfather you in uh, to stay on the originator. On the other hand, if the biosimilar has already launched and you get a prescription for the originator, then in those cases, most likely they will require you to use the biosimilar. So if you're already on an originator drug, uh, you may well be grandfathered in. That's what I'm seeing mostly. Uh, if it's a new prescription where the biosimilars are out there and substantially less expensive, they'll probably require you to use the biosimilar. Almost the same process we have with generics. Uh, you know, if you if you go to the drugstore and your branded drug has a generic, the drugstore's got, in fact, most states have 
substitution regulations that allow the pharmacist to do that uh, uh, without any other permission by the physician, unless that physician is written, dispense is written uh, in the prescription. Okay, thank you. That was very well understood. And I'm glad I was able to ask you those questions. All right, so going forward, um, another question that we have, I'm gonna take some from some of the people online first, and then I'll back up and I'll go to the ones that were asked previously. A person named Kevin asked, maybe I missed it, but isn't the Medicare formulary standard for all 50 states? And, and uh, yes, Kevin, it's a great question. The Medicare process is standard for all 50 states, but it's even worse uh, than what you might imagine. Because as you remember, Medicare Part D, which is the prescription drug side of the formulary, which uh, uh, launched uh, in the 2000s, is privatized, right? So private companies run Medicare Part D and each of those private companies, while they must submit their formularies to uh, uh, Medicare for approval, their formularies are all different. So if you have 10 Medicare carriers in your state, all with Medicare Part D plans, they will all have different formularies. On the other hand, Medicare Part B, B as in boy, which are those drugs administered typically in your physician's office or the, or the outpatient, the coverage rules are the same uh, nationwide. Um, Medicare Advantage plans can do some things that Medicare can't, like prior authorized, which standard Medicare doesn't. But basically for the Medicare medical benefit drugs, those drugs again administered in a facility or by a doctor or sometimes by home care, uh, yes, that coverage is standardized. But if you're taking a pill or something like that that's covered under Part D or a self-injector, then the formulary is uh, varies by who you signed on with for that coverage. Okay, thank you for that. Is there any way of knowing in advance of like turning 65 what might be available for a person or not? Yeah, there is. Uh, 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 Medicare requires the the plan selling Part D benefits to publicly publish their formularies. Uh, so if you're considering signing up, you can, it, it's a lot of work. You have to go and research different formularies to see which ones cover my drugs. Again, there are advocacy groups and things like that can that can assist you with that. Uh, there are even some uh, organizations you can pay uh, like a broker to, to help you with, with that. Uh, uh, sure. And some brokers will do that as part of their service fee for helping place you in a, in a, a Medicare plan. Okay, thank you. All right, Deborah asks, can an insurance company require a person to use a generic medication even if the doctor writes the prescription as name brand only? That's the one exception. If a doctor does write a dispense as written, uh, then neither the pharmacist nor the insurance uh, uh, a, a carrier uh, can, uh, can override that. Uh, but, and there's a big but, that's going to require you to pay much more out of pocket because those will typically, when there's a generic of a brand available, those will be considered non-formulary uh, drugs. And depending on the benefit you have, you could be paying anywhere from 30 to 50 to $70 more per fill than you would be paying uh, for their generic. There are some employer plans that uh, uh, if you request a branded version where the generic is available, they have a pay the difference. So if the generic costs $10 and the brand costs $200, you're going to pay the $190 uh, difference. So you have to weigh. Um, and to be honest with you, I can't think of an instance uh, where there are true generic versions of a drug out that I would tell a patient. Uh, and there may be some, uh, you know, allergic to something uh, that's not drug related in a, in a, a generic drug. Um, for instance, myself, all my family, anybody I uh, interface with, uh, I certainly recommend, uh, you know, FDA approved generic drugs. Uh, uh, I'm not saying there are no cases where that can happen, but just understand that the insurance company won't fight that battle with you, but it may cost you a good bit more. So sure. thank you for that. All right. Deborah writes, um, I actually, Karen writes, where can I learn more about patient appeals and have more protection under the law than provider appeals? Well, uh, one of the things is you can certainly have a, I think you make these, do you make these programs available 
uh, to go back to, uh, Stuart. That's one way to do it. Generally, as I pointed out on one slide, if you remember on the right-hand side, in an introductory, your state, almost every state has a member rights uh, uh, brochure that's available on their website. So uh, if you go like I use New Jersey example, the Department of Banking and Insurance or Pennsylvania, the, uh, the Department of Insurance, uh, they'll have your member rights uh, on there. You can also ask your health plan for your appeal rights and, and they do have to uh, send those to you. So uh, there are places. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know a lot of uh, uh, um, Stuart, you're, you, I, I will not blow my own horn, but you're to be commended for, you know, doing a program that talks about appeal rights because sometimes people don't understand all of the, 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 uh, the differences. It's easy to assume, oh, gee, my doctor, you know, they're the best one to deal with all this. And, you know, my answer there is you're your best advocate, uh, work with your doctor, work with a representative, but in the end, it's your health and your you're ultimately the best advocate. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next, um, a person writes, what if you've been an MS patient in Europe, but you're returning to the United States as a citizen? Can you get an, Can you get insurance under the Affordable Care Act? Yeah, I think as long as you return as a citizen, you would be eligible for uh, ACA coverage. Uh, 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 you know, assuming A, uh, you're not Medicare eligible because if you're a citizen, you're Medicare eligible, you can get Medicare. Uh, or B, if you're disabled, you may be able to get Medicare. But yes, you, you know, as long as you're a citizen, you would be eligible uh, for insurance benefits under the Affordable Care Act or Medicare. Or, uh, you know, uh, if you're of limited means, you may be able to uh, be covered under Medicaid or in some cases, duly eligible under Medicare and Medicaid. So there are multiple options for for citizens, for sure. Okay, thank you. That leads into the next one. How do multiple insurances work together, primary and secondary? What's What determines how much the secondary is responsible to pay? And, and it's all predicated upon the primary insurance carrier. And, and, and the best way, uh, best example I can give is if you have Medicare, Medicare is responsible first. So you have to meet things like your deductibles in Medicare, uh, you have to meet any co-payments uh, or co, well, you don't have to meet those. Let's just say you have to meet your deductible in, in Medicare, and then Medicare pays its portion. And then once Medicare pays its portion, your secondary or supplemental insurance will cover up to their limits. And then finally, anything left over after that uh, is your responsibility. Typically, that stuff works without you, the patient, having to do anything uh, in commercial insurance, it's rare to have both a primary and secondary insurance unless you have one of those uh, secondary plans that covers you for lost wages or things like that when uh, when you're ill, and then you have to coordinate those benefits. Sometimes there's also coordination of benefits uh, uh, with uh, things like your auto insurance in most states. Uh, if you're injured in an automobile accident, your auto insurance covers you up to your benefit maximum under that. Then your health insurance becomes secondary and picks up everything like that. But let's just say for MS, uh, if you're in Medicare, Medicare covers up to its benefit limits. And then those claims are automatically forwarded to your secondary insurance carrier because that's on, on file with Medicare. It's all done electronically in your secondary carrier covers its portion, and then anything left over after that is your responsibility. Okay, thank you for that. All right, before I go on to the other questions, I want to let everybody know that we have live programs coming up on, when I say live, I mean in-person programs coming up um, in, in the month of August. We have several, all right? We have four, actually. I mean, I remember when we had none, right, in 2020? Okay, so we have uh, in-person programs coming up on August 1st, in Rapid City or just outside in a town called, small little area called Box Elder. We have um, the middle of August, we have Mason, Ohio. Uh, we have Maitland, Florida. And at the end of August, we'll be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota as, uh, again. So Rapid City at the beginning, Sioux Falls at the end in, in South Dakota. Um, I'm bringing these up because um, it's not just in person, but each of these programs are also virtual. We have different speakers at the different programs. In the one that's in Rapid City, we have Dr. Sam Hunter. In Mason, Ohio, we have Aaron Boster. In Maitland, Florida, we have a 
a nurse practitioner that's coming in from Salt Lake City. I'm sorry, I forgot her name, so I can't say it right now. Um, and then at the end of the month in Sioux Falls, we have um, Dr. Jonathan Cockwood and another doctor there as well, as well as the National MS Society will be speaking at that program and, uh, and, and a patient advocate. And I'm also bringing all this up because at these different programs, they're going to be speaking about different medications, including generics, including biosimilars. And you'll get to know a lot more about all the different classes of medications that are either out here right now or soon to be coming, like including the BTK inhibitors and other things as well. So if you want to know more about these medications, you know, go back to our website and get registered for these programs online or go to them, you know wherever they are in the United States, find a place and go to it, okay? And uh, and there's plenty to learn out there. All right, now let me get back to um, some of these other questions. So uh, I see Kevin's got a couple of questions. I'm gonna ask, let him, I'm not gonna let him ask, but I'm gonna ask his questions as well in a few moments, all right? But um, um, a person wrote in that they wanna know what the deal is and how to appeal, especially if she is not getting any of her medications that she needs to be getting because she's over 65, um, she feels that she's not getting the right help from her doctor's office, barely any, as well as she's not getting anywhere with the Medicare system, but needs her medications and cannot afford it. So instead of getting worse, she wants an answer from you. Yeah, well, that was the whole gist of the, the Medicare process. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, your doctor's office uh, isn't giving you the help you might need. Um, the There are some advocacy organizations that can help you. I don't know where you are. So, you know, I don't know uh, what might be a, a available uh, in your region. Um, you know, certainly if it's a desperate situation, but it would be expensive, uh, you can hire an attorney to help you. Uh, deal with that, but that gets expensive quite quickly. And, uh, you know, there, uh, some law firms don't want to deal with small things like uh, like appeals. Uh, there are some organizations that for a fee also will help you work with uh, uh, appeals. Uh, some of them are former health plan employees that put together uh, these uh, advocacy organizations. But again, there's a fee uh, involved in that. There, there's no quick answer no magic button you can push. Uh, uh, you fall into that group who sounds like you do need help, and uh, uh, you know, looking for those third uh, parties to help you is probably the best advice I I can give you. It because it isn't a simple process. Uh, you you saw that, and and uh, sometimes you know you as a layperson may not know exactly you know what you need to say and how you need to say it to provide. Uh, the rationale for getting the medicines you need. Okay, hey, thank you for that. All right, back to Kevin, since this is similar as well. Uh, anyone over 65 is no longer eligible for ACA, correct? 65 and over must have Medicare, I thought. I love my ACA plan. My slightly older wife does not like her Medicare. So what can you tell us about that? Unfortunately, you're, there's not much you can do. The government is the government. And when you turn 65, you are required to take Medicare Part A. Uh, you also take Medicare Part B, although you do have to sign up for Medicare Part B, and Medicare Part B does have a premium. And then beyond that, to get adequate coverage, you we need, need to do a supplemental plan on top of uh, standard Medicare, or you need to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, which is a managed Medicare plan, uh, that's either available in a PPO or HMO uh, a variety. Um, and uh, uh, that wraps in both your standard Medicare and your supplemental coverage uh, and your drug coverage in, into one package, which uh, uh, you also, once you reach Medicare age, you have to uh, have Medicare drug coverage or Part D. So you have to have Medicare Parts A, B, and D, uh, uh, or uh, you can take Medicare Part C, which is the three of those uh, put together. Uh, <clears throat> to my knowledge, there are no opt-outs in, uh, in, in that program. So, so let me ask Unless you a question. Getting employer insurance, but that's a different story. 
Well, that's what I was going to ask. If you're over 65 and you're still working a full-time job and your employer offers medical insurance, can you opt to stay on that and not switch over to Medicare? You can. You can. Okay. And it's considered credible coverage. Uh, and then when you when you no longer do that, uh, when no longer employed, uh, then you switch over to Medicare. Uh, the caveat there now is more and more employers right? When employees reach the age of 65, we're moving them to Medicare because for them, it makes sense financially. Right. Okay. But if you're your own employer, you can, and if you have health coverage for you and your staff, it means that you can stay on. You're good to go. Yep. That's right. That's right. Okay. And that has nothing to do with me. I'm just mentioning it. Okay. (laughs) All right. Denise asks, is it better to separate Medicare from your supplements? Uh, Well, Medicare and supplements, by definition, are separated, which means that if you are on standard Medicare, then the supplemental coverage is the wraparound coverage that kicks in or provides coverage for when Medicare stops. I think what you're talking about is Medicare Advantage. Again, that's Part C, which rolls in. Medicare A, Medicare B, and drug coverage into one. And the answer there is you really have to evaluate it for what your needs are and what plans are available in your particular region and what the cost of of, of the Medicare Advantage plan is versus the cost of having drug coverage, supplemental coverage, and Medicare Part B premiums. Uh, So it's a lot about, you know, literally sitting down and, and checking all of that and, and lining up all the different uh, uh, things to decide whether um, you want a Medicare Part C plan, which is, you know, one sign up and it's all done, <clears throat> versus signing up for Medicare, um, Parts A and B through the government, a supplemental plan through a private carrier like the Blue Cross plans or United or Aetna or Humana, and then drug coverage through yet a third party like a, a, a PBM. Uh, for ease of administration, it's often much easier to go with a Medicare Advantage plan because uh, it, you know it's it you're you're putting all your eggs in one basket and and uh, uh, getting coverage. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, it becomes a personal decision uh, which way you want to go because anytime you go into a Medicare Advantage plan, it's going to be network based and you may have some network limitations both in and out of network. Uh, so is there one best way? Uh, no, just like there's, you know, if you were asking me what's the best car to buy, I would give you a very similar analogous answer. Well, how far do you drive? You know, uh, do you need space? Do you need efficiency? Uh, there is no best, uh, uh, way to go with Medicare and insurance, just like there's no best car for everyone. Another thing to add into that is that uh, for those that go on to Medicare younger than 65, the price of some of the Medicare supplements and or Advantage plans are a lot more than when you turn 65. Yeah. And you have to look into that as well, because you may find a, a Medicare plan from uh, company A that's going to be uh, different as an advantage plan, that versus the supplement versus another plan, the the prices could be far off. And also, what are they actually covering for you? So, you know, these are things that you do need an advocate to help you out with. Um, and if anybody um, does not know the answer to that or don't know where to go, you know, you can always contact us and we'll let you know. Okay. And sometimes your insurance broker will also help you with that as well. Right. For those that have an insurance broker. Yeah. All right. Next, uh, Charlene, I was denied twice by my Medicare Advantage plan. I have recently applied to the drug pharmaceutical company. Any suggestions are welcomed. If you were denied twice, you still have additional rights of appeal in Medicare. Remember, up to five levels or practically after the third level. It's uh, from a timing standpoint. Uh, <clears throat> virtually every drug company does have some compassionate use uh, type uh, uh, programs. Most of them are for the under or uninsured. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think your two options are, you know, you can try that route. 
your other option and maybe a better option is to talk to you about to your healthcare provider or what other options do I have? Remember, you do have, uh, I don't know what, and you know, I don't need to know nor want to know publicly what the circumstances of your denial are. But in today's world with MS, you know, it's hard for me to come up with a circumstance where there probably isn't at least another reasonable alternative or two. Just in direct MS therapies, not counting the biologics, there are 23 options available. Uh, you know, so talk to your healthcare provider and see if there's something else you can work it out. Sometimes it's better to pursue that route than continue to try to go down a, a pathway of difficulty, if not potential futility. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you for all your answers tonight. We are out of questions. And so I'm going to say good night to you. Good night to everybody that was online. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Owens. Again, thank you for all the work that you're doing out there and for participating with our calls. All right. Everybody have a great night and ciao. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, thanks for uh, inviting me, Stuart. It's been my pleasure and I'll be back again soon. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.